All right, joining me now, he covers the Minnesota Vikings for Purple Insider, and he's the host of the Purple Insider podcast. It is Matthew Collar. Matthew, thanks for coming on. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well, and uh, you just informed me before we went on that I have now made the most appearances on your show of any guests, so I am honored to be here for the third time. Yes, third time on a show of mine. First time when I'm here at PFF, so um, you've taken over the leaderboard when it comes to combined appearances, so um, congratulations on that. It's also great meeting you at the combine, we had to meet in person, so um, a lot of great things going on, and you know what I wanted to do here is, you know, we're kind of entering the slow portion of the offseason where there's not much going on, but um, the NFL always find a way to make stuff happen, like this week we're going to have the schedule release, and they're going to stretch it out a whole week of releasing games until a four-hour show on Thursday night so they know how to juice it out but when it comes to the news aspect there won't be that much going on so i wanted to go and take a look at which teams had the best off season and i uh, will both choose one we'll probably do three each but i want to do that on the back end of the episode i want to start off talking about the team you cover and that's the vikings because they had so much turnover this off season with a new gm a new head coach some new additions some subtractions whatever it is um let me start off with really the draft because you know I was just fascinated with their first round where they trade from down from 12 down to 32 and they trade with the Lions to allow them to get Jamison Williams. And I felt like they didn't really get enough. And I know probably on the value charts they did. I was kind of curious to know what did you think of that move and what the Vikings overall did in that first round? Yeah, I guess uh, what I found out is there are many different ways to look at a trade when it comes to the NFL draft. There's the Jimmy Johnson chart. There's the PFF yes. chart. Some people have their own charts. Teams probably have their own charts of what they think the draft picks are worth. But as soon as the players are picked, we kind of have to throw the charts out the window and look at who the Detroit Lions were trading up for, who the Vikings decided they didn't want to draft at the 12th overall pick and who they decided they did want to draft at number 32. And then they ended up moving back from 34 to 42. Uh, I won't go through all the trades uh, to make your head spin, but there was <laughs> another one in the second round with the Packers, which yes. I think they got decidedly better value than the Packers did. But this one with Detroit, much more debatable considering that, I mean, this was a draft that had about 15 players that a lot of people can considered the sort of cream of the crop of this draft. And the Vikings decided they were going to move out of those elite prospects to go all the way to the back of the first round. I think historically speaking, that's pretty risky because in that top 10, top 12, top 15 range, that's where a lot of stars come from. And even when you look at the history of the 12th overall pick, Deshaun Watson was picked there. You have Micah Parsons even last year. Odell Beckham was the 12th overall pick. That's usually a pretty good spot. And so doing this trade with a division rival also has to be factored in that if you're giving points on a chart, you're not going to say, well, you know, that guy could smoke you someday in, an, in another game. But this is a guy who, if he turns out to be really good and Jamison Williams could smoke you two times a year for the foreseeable future. And you're taking that risk when you make that trade that that could happen. And so they end up getting a very good prospect at 32 in Lewis Seen, and then at 42 with Andrew Booth Jr., somebody that a lot of people had much higher on their board, if not for injuries. So there's also that factor too, that the player, another player that they used as part of the draft capital might have a high ceiling, might have some red flags to him. Um, so I, I think that it ends up being kind of like one of those tests, like the blot tests that you yes. look at and you decide that it looks like, I don't know, Mars or something. Um, and you know, that it's, so it's one of those, it's like, it really depends on how you look at it. I personally lean towards saying if Jamison Williams becomes a star player, I don't know how you can justify that trade. However, if Lewis Seen and Andrew Booth Jr. result in the Vikings rebuilding a secondary that was really atrocious over the last couple of years and Jamison Williams doesn't become a star, then we'll all say, what a genius trade. Everybody kind of gets to decide after the fact whether they were right or wrong on draft day, because I think this one could kind of go either way. But did you feel like the overall return just didn't, it just didn't feel enough. You know what I mean? Like it was dropping down 20 spots. There was no future first round pick. Detroit has two picks next year. Did you feel like the package they got back, forget about the players. They didn't know who they're going to have there on the board. Did you feel like the package when it happened at number 12, was that enough for you? 
Uh, for me, it was not. No, um, in part knowing that Detroit was moving up to take Jamison Williams because everybody had him as that either him or Kyle Hamilton was who Detroit was going to take. And those are two of the elite prospects in this draft. And to not have to give up a next year's first for that. I mean, historically, that's just different. Like usually teams that move up, there was the example of the New Orleans Saints, who I think went up 13 spots and gave up a next year's first for that to draft Marcus Davenport. Yes. Um, we saw it happen uh, even uh, the year before with uh, Justin Fields. Now that might've played into it is that it, they weren't trading up for a quarterback, which is naturally going to be different because teams trying to trade down are saying, okay, pony up if you want this franchise quarterback. Um, however, usually they win the trade on the charts by a lot when you're asked. Usually yes. we don't have this debate of, hey, this chart says you won. This chart says you didn't. Normally we're saying, OK, the team that traded down absolutely, you know, hoodwinked this other team and won this trade by a lot. Uh, and instead we're left to kind of go, well, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. And uh, ultimately history will decide whether they did or did. So it really all comes back to the general manager and Kwesi Adolfo Mento was hired this off season. I think every, all my colleagues here at PFF love the guy because of what his beliefs are and how he's so into analytics. This is a guy who worked on wall street before getting into the NFL. I mean, he's a really, really smart guy, I guess. What are your thoughts on Kwesi and the job he's done so far as GM? Because it's such a different philosophy. He's a different type of a GM. We don't really have that many of these type of guys in the NFL. What do you think about him and what he's done so far in Minnesota? Yeah, the way that I would put it is you would have to tell me that that was his background for me to know um, <laughs> because it has not felt like they brought in this totally fresh voice and he just uh, analytics everything to death. I mean, there are a lot of things from reading PFF for many years and having a lot of the analysts for PFF on my shows and yourself on my show and talking about the things that are the most analytically sound to do. I think if you maybe studied some other teams, you would say, oh, okay, I, th th that team is like it, with Baltimore with fourth downs, for example, like, you know, that Baltimore is being guided by the analytics because they're going for fourth downs all the time. It wasn't as easy to spot with the Vikings because I think the analytically sound thing to do would have been to tear down a lot of pieces of this roster and it would have been to get their salary cap situation right. Their salary cap situation has not been ideal in a very, very long time, uh, really since maybe about 2015. And uh, it's caused them a lot of problems that they're never able to really fill the spots the way that they need to fill them. And weaknesses on the roster have been the main culprit of them missing the playoffs the last two years. And they really doubled down on a strategy that has not worked. I mean, they've brought in exciting veteran players in free agency before uh, last year, they signed, you know, Patrick Peterson and a couple of other defensive players that didn't work out the year before that they traded for Yanni Kingakwe that didn't work out. And this year they signed Zedarius Smith and it might work better than some of those previously mentioned moves, but it seems like it's really the same strategy to fill immediate spots with veteran players, look for deals in free agency and try to patch it all together with tape and glue around an expensive quarterback contract, which as we know, those are extremely, extremely difficult to work around. Uh, even if you have an elite quarterback, look at the Seattle Seahawks and Russell Wilson, how much trouble they had uh, repeating yeah. their previous results after they had paid uh, Russell Wilson, a huge contract. And so Wilson is a decidedly better quarterback than Kirk cousins. They have not been able to figure this out and they didn't do things that made you think, oh, okay. Like now they've, they've figured out some way to work around that expensive contract either. They did the same restructures extensions that do not make life easier for them down the road. And they added to an extension with Kirk cousins void years in the future. Meaning that if Kirk cousins isn't here in 2024, he's still going to make $12 million on their cap, which is not good for their future. And then with the draft, it's possible they use the more analytically sound right. chart than the JJ charts to uh, trade down. Maybe that's about the most analytical thing they did. They did draft good athletes later in the rounds, which maybe in the past Rick Spielman didn't always do. But if nobody told you the Vikings had a new general manager, um, you might not have noticed because things in right. their general approach were so similar to how they were with Rick Spielman. You know, what I find amazing about Quezzi is that the Vikings GM job came down to him and Ryan Poles. Poles, of course, goes to Chicago. They're kind of tied into each other. I want to see how both those guys do just because he was the other finalist in Minnesota. When you bring all that up, 
where are the Vikings right now? Are, it's, it's clearly not a rebuild. Is it a remodel? Is it going all in? Where are they right now, in your opinion? Yeah, and that's really interesting you bring up Ryan Poles because Chicago has taken much more Step of back, a full yeah. rebuild approach, which we, we always thought that that's what the Vikings would do when they fire Mike Zimmer and fire Rick Spielman. It never stood to reason that they would keep everybody else And yet that's basically what they did. Anthony Barr is not going to be here. So that's a long time name that's gone. But aside from that, it's still sort of the same players that they've been clutching onto since they had to really uh, revamp the roster in 2020 when a lot of their stars from the 2017 team that went to the NFC championship got old. And so earlier this offseason, Kwesi Adafo Mensa called it a competitive rebuild, but I don't see the rebuild part. There's nothing that they have done that I could say, okay, that's very rebuildy of you. I mean, drafting players is not a rebuild. Every team drafts players except for the Los Angeles Rams. So you, that's not like rebuilding because every team could argue, oh yeah, we're, we're building while trying to compete. Uh, all the other things, keeping Adam Thielen, keeping Harrison Smith, extending Kirk Cousins when there were offers to trade for all of those players, uh, even keeping a running back on a very expensive contract. Again, not the most analytically sound thing. Uh, not that they had a ton of options with Delvin Cook because of how his contract was set up, but even then, like not looking toward the future, saying, how can we create the most cap space down the road to use? Uh, they didn't do that and they hurt themselves down the road with the way that they restructured deals, which means to me that this has to be called all in that just because the general manager says the word rebuild. I mean, that sounds much more to me, like kind of a cop-out kind of, Hey, if we go eight, nine, it was, uh, we were competitively rebuilding, but even though every move says all in, they signed Jordan Hicks, for example, as a, a linebacker from the Arizona Cardinals, it's like, well, you know, they could have played their younger linebackers. They could have played Brian Asamoah, who they just drafted. They could have played Blake Lynch, who is a developing player, Chaz Surratt, Troy Dye. Those guys were recent draft picks that have not seen the field a whole lot. And instead they said, no, we need to replace Anthony Barr with another veteran player out the free agent market. Like those are not moves that you do if you're trying to rebuild and evaluate all the pieces the same thing goes for even the, the guard position where they brought in two veteran players to battle for the right guard spot as opposed to trying Wyatt Davis there or the player that they just drafted in the second round as a guard. Uh, instead, it's, it's been very much all in, got to win now type of moves with a 34-year-old quarterback who is the fourth highest cap hit in the NFL. None of this says uh, rebuild. So the way that I'm evaluating this season is you better be right because there was a very clear other path. So you better be able to win more games than you did under Mike Zimmer and Rick Spielman. So you can point back at them and say it was their fault because otherwise, I mean, you're going to look like you just didn't really read the room very well or didn't get very good advice and direction from the team's ownership, which has also become a conversation this off season of whether the owners will not allow them to take the step back that they may desperately need. Now, you mentioned the quarterback and Kirk Cousins. I think that element is always going to be a topic. And I kind of feel like he's at times a punching bag for the media and fans. Sometimes it's deserved. Sometimes I don't feel like it is. But they extend them on one year. They add a no trade clause, which I think is very noteworthy. How many more years do you feel like he's the quarterback in Minnesota? I mean, it's such a big topic. It always comes up. There were some trade rumors. It wasn't that serious, if it appears like. But his future in Minnesota, where do you believe it is? He wants to retire there as the quarterback, be there for many more years. He's the king of business when it comes to the quarterback position. I mean, the amount of money he's made is incredible. But where do you sit on Kirk Cousins? So my understanding of how the Cousins situation went down this offseason is that Kwesi Adafo Mensa in the front office got trade offers and took them to ownership and ownership said, that's not enough. That's my understanding of how it's been told to me of what went down. And that's really interesting too, because you think about Matt Ryan in Atlanta, the minute that his team flirted with the idea of other quarterbacks, he said, get me out of here where cousins signed an extension for one year with the no trade clause, which is, as you said, very notable because if it wasn't, we would, I think be saying, okay, this is clearly the final year of cousins. And the only reason they wanted to do this was to lower his cap hit and because the draft as we all found out did not have a bevy of good quarterback prospects to choose from and if the uh, prognosticators are correct which again not always as we learned this year uh, there should be better prospects next year for the potential future quarterback and I think that's what the plan is going to be which is to 
stay with the core that they have and try to win over this next year and then see where they're at. If they go seven and 10 or eight and nine, then they draft a quarterback and either play it out and let that player sit on the bench with, with cousins and let him then go be a free agent. Or they simply say, you're not our future quarterback. You're not getting any other extensions from us. Why don't you go play for someone else? And I think what Carson Wentz proves to us is there will always be a market. If you are a competent NFL quarterback, uh, and, and so I think that that's probably the Vikings plan, but the issue with that is by keeping cousins and kicking this down the road, you're essentially saying it had to have been Mike Zimmer's fault. that cousins couldn't win because you didn't really change the circumstances around him. They have done nothing on offense. I, mean, I thought that they would draft Jamison Williams because yeah. they, they hire an offensive head coach. And, and my feeling was, well, the Rams kept adding wide receivers like crazy. I think this might be what the Vikings do. Well, they didn't. So it's all the same players on offense. That means that Kevin O'Connell has to be much better offensively than his predecessors in order to get this team over the top because it does not project as an elite defense. And all of this kind of screams eight and nine or nine and eight, doesn't it? I mean, unless Kevin O'Connell is vastly better than his predecessors, Gary Kubiak, Kevin Stefanski, most notably, um, then you're probably ending up in a lot of the same spaces. And if you do, then you have to draft a quarterback for the future and see if there's trade offers out there for cousins. So what it feels like they did this year, and they have every opportunity to prove me wrong with this, but uh, they, uh, what they did was just kick the ball down the road or kick the can down the road another year with something that's pretty much inevitable. And even when you think about Kirk cousins, age 34 years old, by this same age, Joe Flacco was a Denver Bronco. Like we, Tom Brady has totally messed up. We think what we think about old quarterbacks, 34, 35. If you are not one of the elite players, historically is the point where quarterbacks start to fade. And so if cousins does have some regression after three seasons, statistically of playing very well, and they don't have the team to make up for that. And they're going to end up with another season where we shrug our shoulders, but it's probably going to be just good enough to allow them not to draft in the top 10 to get whatever quarterback prospect they need, which means trading up. And then we sort of go round and round again on how you rebuild the team. And I think that, you know, by not sort of recognizing reality, they have taken the risk. And again, it's not a guarantee for me, but it is a risk that they have set their franchise back by several years on something that they probably already needed to do. Yep, and again, the no trade clause is so big in here because it happened in two places in this offseason. It happened with the Raiders and Derek Carr. He got one as well. Kirk Cousins got one in his deal with Minnesota. It just tells me if things go sideways, we have a say here in what happens next, and we could determine where we end up going. It happened with Russell Wilson. It happened with Deshaun Watson. Obviously, those are bigger name quarterbacks, but they will have a say if that does happen in their scenarios. You mentioned Kevin O'Connell, the new head coach. What do you see in him? I mean, I saw him, the first thing with me when I saw him at the combat, dude is super tall. I mean, he's he's like six foot seven. He's gigantic. But in terms of his offense, obviously there are pieces there. Justin Jefferson, Thielen, Cook, Cousins at quarterback. What do you see with him taking over this offense now? An offensive minded head coach, a bit of a youth movement there on the offensive side with him taking over. What do you believe he does with that offense? Yeah, I've gotten a few tweets of people saying, hey, you kind of look like Kevin O'Connell. I was like, you haven't seen us stand next to each other. I'm six foot one, but he towers over me and his hands, much bigger hand size. So uh, he, he would have done better than Kenny Pickett in that area by quite a bit. Um, oh, savage. Uh, you know, my first my first impression of Kevin O'Connell is that he is very McVeigh ish in his approach to how he's dealing with players. It seems like it's a much more positive environment than Mike Zimmer was creating. And Mike Zimmer was old school raised by parcels and certainly lived that life. I mean, he was very hard on his players, an incredible teacher and, and very, very good when it came to scheming and working like crazy and all those things that the old school coaches did. But if there was a shortcoming, it was, not really adapting a whole lot to how players want to be treated in the year 2022. Although I'm sure the old school players would have appreciated it more too, but they just maybe were willing to put up with more than players are now. And there was a lot of frustration in the locker room. Of course, 
there wasn't so much of that in 2017 when the team was winning all the time. Then it was great that Zimmer was an old yeah. school head coach. Funny how those narratives change. But um, the reality is that when things aren't going well and the conductor of the train is not treating people all that well and is very frustrated uh, with the general manager, with the roster, with the players, with his quarterback and doesn't trust his quarterback and, and on and on and on, it's, it sort of snowballs. And so what they looked for was the exact opposite of Mike Zimmer, someone who's going to be much more of a player's coach, a former NFL player, a guy who comes from an offensive background and a very positive first environment background, like with the Los Angeles Rams. And so players have already talked about how uh, it is much more in the, the buzzword of the off season is collaborative, but uh, hearing out the players when they have suggestions, when they have questions, um, not calling out players in meetings for mistakes uh, in the way that Mike Zimmer sort of became famous for doing. And, you know, I think that you know, that certainly is part of solving some of the problems of the previous regime. But the real question is how much of it is it really? Because Mike Zimmer schemed up this team 51 sacks last year, which was second in the NFL. Yeah. And uh, they didn't have a whole lot of pass rushing talent after losing Daniil Hunter. Like Mike Zimmer had a lot of the right ideas with Kirk Cousins. People can point at Mike Zimmer and say he didn't know what he was doing offensively. Then I guess I have to ask why Kirk Cousins has had his best three seasons over the last three years of his entire career. Career and why the Vikings have the sixth best quarterback rating since 2015 of all NFL teams and all the other ones have elite quarterbacks. I think Mike Zimmer actually had a lot of very good ideas, some shortcomings, wanting to run the ball too often and things like that. But, uh, you know, I think that pointing the finger entirely at Mike Zimmer and saying our new coach, he's going to be everything that Mike Zimmer wasn't. He's going to have all the answers. He's going to manage the game perfectly. He's going to treat the players perfectly. He's going to scheme much better. Like in an ideal world, that all happens and this team wins 12 games. And it's possible with their schedule, which, uh, you know, has, uh, you know, some some pretty easy teams on it or should be easy teams. They lost to Cooper Rush last year and the Lions. So I can't say that they uh, yes. should be that easy. But, you know, it, it's not it's not the most daunting schedule with the divisions they're playing against. So maybe all of that will come to fruition with Kevin O'Connell. But I also think that, you know, he's got a difficult task. First year head coaches, we have not seen a whole lot of them come on the scene, save for someone like McVay and set the world on fire. Um, there's usually a, a pretty big period of, of uh, adaptation that's required there. Um, but I think that Kevin O'Connell at very least will have a locker room that is much more behind him than what Mike Zimmer had the last two years. Let me ask you one more thing here in Minnesota. Are you guys already talking about the Justin Jefferson extension for next year and how big that's going to be? Because if very it's going to be massive. That's if he's here. I mean, truly, yeah. that's if he's here. Because if you're Justin Jefferson – I mean, A, you look around and go, Devontae Adams decided where he wanted to play, right? He said, I will play for the Las Vegas Raiders. Trade me there. Thank you. And if you're Justin Jefferson, is Minnesota where you want to be? Because receivers, if you're as good as him, get to choose now where they want to go, uh, which is a really interesting dynamic to kind of pair with where they are as a franchise, because you could kind of speculate, well, did they want to run it all back? to make Jefferson happy and be competitive. But then there's the other part that if you go eight, nine or seven and 10 and Justin Jefferson has been a top three receiver in the world and not made the playoffs in his first three years, he's not putting pen to paper. So it absolutely has to be a big part of the conversation. Uh, Jefferson got frustrated last year by the targets and then they started to push the ball to him more often in the second half of the year. And he ended up with amazing numbers. Um, but that's been a big part of it too. It's like Justin Jefferson wants Cooper rush numbers. Numbers, and maybe that's part of what will make him happy. But also having been around Justin Jefferson for two years, I don't think he accepts losing. I don't think that he's the type of receiver who says, Hey, as long as I get my numbers and my paycheck, I'm good to go. He uh, I've seen him after tough losses. I mean, he is crushed. Like th this guy won a national championship at LSU and expects to win championships in the NFL and has played like a championship player and been let down by what's around him. So if this franchise looks like it's spinning its wheels and floundering, I don't think Justin Jefferson is going to say, oh yeah, I can't wait to sign that contract. The other thing that he knows is he's going to get paid by whatever team. Like it's not like Justin will lose out on money somehow by holding out or, you know, whatever else, what he's accomplished already and what he projects to accomplish. Plus he's still very young. I think he's still 22 years old. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe going on 23 this year um, there's yeah. I think that uh, Vikings fans should be 
quite concerned about that situation and, and what it has to come in the future. And boy, if you don't make the playoffs, if you don't compete for a Super Bowl and you've wasted three years of a top three wide receiver in his early prime, I mean, that that's going to be regret cities for uh, the Vikings. I feel like the only difference, though, would be comparing him to Devontae or even Tyreek is that he would be entering year four next year. He, he will still have year four, a fifth-year option, and even a franchise tax. The leverage really isn't there for him compared to some of these other guys where Debo has one year left and a tag possibly. A.J. Brown had a year left and a possible tag. But in his case, he has at least three more years left. So I guess Minnesota would have the leverage there with him if it gets ugly. But um, still a lot more time until we get there with that scenario. All right, let me jump into the um, other segment of this um, podcast, I guess, which is, again, we're entering this slow portion of the offseason. A lot of these rosters are basically set. Um, Obviously, there will be some other moves. Um, For the most part, the hard work is already in the draft is in the free agency period for the most part is done. So let's go through the, some of the teams this offseason that had a good or a really good offseason in your mind. You'll pick one. I'll pick one. We'll probably each do three of them in total. In total, so six um, in total, I should say. So um, guest first. Go ahead, Matthew. Who do you have? Number one. Well, it's pretty hard to argue with the Denver Broncos and the improvement they made. I mean, when was their last good quarterback? I mean, Pey- Peyton Manning would be it. And Peyton Manning, I think 2014, like even when he won the Super Bowl, he wasn't playing well. It's been a while yeah. since they have had really good quarterback play. And now they got potentially great quarterback play. And you think about what Russell Wilson gets to inherit there. Good wide receivers, a stable looking franchise, a new offensive coach in, in Nate Hackett. Um, They probably improved a lot there with bringing in Nate Hackett. I think Vic Fangio, while very brilliant on defense, was uh, struggling in a lot of other areas of being a head coach. Um, So I I think I would select Denver as the team that has probably improved more than anybody else in the NFL. Yeah, I mean, that was probably my first choice as well. And it's really, it's amazing when you look at what they did. I mean, like there's obviously the Wilson element, but then there's like even the defensive additions of a DJ Jones and Randy Gregory, but it also kind of all dates back to last year. And you guys know George Payton really well. He was in Minnesota forever. But when you go back to see what he did last year, the Von Miller trade a second and a third for an expiring contract. And the one that that doesn't really get talked about enough is the extensions for Tim Patrick and Corlin Sutton in season to get them signed before the wide receiver market explodes. I think that's another thing that he did that was really, really smart. Last year, of course, drafting Patrick Sertan, number nine overall over a quarterback. He looks like a star. Javante Williams in the second round, another really good player. They traded up to get him. And they already have the guys like a Simmons and a Chubb and a Judy Bowles um, at left tackle and others on this roster. It's definitely a team that, you know, George Payton, as I said, you guys know him so well. He had so many opportunities during his time in Minnesota to leave. He decided to stay and he picked Denver as his team, getting a six-year contract. He's turned that team around fairly quickly. Of course, a very tough um, division there, but what he's done this offseason has been really, really impressive. I'm going to go into the NFC North in your division and look at the Detroit Lions. And it's not a team that made them any splashy moves, but when I look at them and Brad Holmes, the GM, Dan Campbell, the head coach, when they were hired, it was a bit of a unique situation where there was so much losing. There was so much bad drafting. There was so much overspending in free agency. And they both got six-year contracts, which is, again, it's extremely rare to have that. Five is usually the max. Four with a team option is usually the norm. They both got six-year deals. And we're basically told, hey, be patient, build this team up from the ground up and try to do a year away without doing anything crazy. And you look at what they did last year, and it was really about setting the culture and building the youth, bringing youth into the building and, you know, trading away a staffer for two first round picks. That's going to help um, add culture guys like a Michael Brockers, a Jamal Williams, Alex Anzalone. Again, not splashy players, but guys who could fit in the roster. And then drafting a Sewell and a Malaran St. Brown and others solidify the trenches. It feels like they finally built a little bit of a culture. Then going into this offseason, and one more thing, going back to last year, they were always in games last year, right? They had, I think they had seven one-possession games last year. So they clearly were playing really hard for the coaches. But going into this offseason, they still stayed pretty patient, right? They didn't go crazy. It's like DJ Charks and Mike Hughes and Deshaun Elliott's all one-year deals. Not splashy, but guys who could help out. And then you get to the draft and you get an eight and hundreds of the drop to you at number two. Jamison Williams, we talked about that, trading up a guy who they believe is going to be a star at wide receiver. The second round to get a guy, Josh Pascal, another pass rusher. There are just so many building blocks on this roster. And eventually the goal will be to find the quarterback. But 
which again, that could happen probably next year. I think that was the goal when they came in, but you know how the Rams, and you mentioned it before, they don't really draft in the early rounds. They're always in the late rounds and, you know, they find their players there. One of the guys main responsible for that was Brad Holmes, who came from the Rams to the Lions. He's a talent evaluator at heart. Same thing with John Dorsey who's in that front office. It just feels like for the first time in a long time, this team is going in the right direction. They're doing it the right way. I don't think it's going to happen this year, but I've enjoyed watching how they've been doing this. And this offseason was another step forward for them, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that there's a, sort of a perception that because the Lions are the Lions, it could yeah. never work and it will just go continue to circle the toilet. But uh, the reality is the Buffalo Bills were the same way for a long time. And then they got good decision makers in, hit on a quarterback, rebuilt in a very smart way. They tore that roster down and built it back up. And they are now Vegas favorites for the Super Bowl. I mean, trust me, I, I never would have thought Buffalo would be in this spot considering they missed the playoffs for 20 straight years, but it can happen fast. And I think that what is interesting about the last two teams we talked about, Denver and Detroit, is that they've done a lot of things that, a lot of people suggested for the Vikings to say, look, you ran to the end of your uh, run with Kirk Cousins, and now you need to go to the bottom and start to build it up again. Or even, even if you want to do a competitive rebuild, do what uh, Denver did and kind of have that filler quarterback like Teddy was for them last year. Uh, that's not what they've done. And I think both teams are in a better position that even Detroit this year, I would not be completely shocked if Detroit won something like eight games and was right there yeah, because yeah. Jared Goff, I mean, he struggled a lot last year, played through injuries. The team was really bad, but this guy, when he's had ideal circumstances has been in the playoffs, what three times in his career made a um, Super Bowl. I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. Right. So like if you give him the right situation and now they get Jamison Williams to add, and it looks like he's going to come back from his injury, maybe faster than anticipated. Uh, the, you know, they look like they could be a team that's not dangerous for a Super Bowl, but is dangerous for a future Super Bowl. And for this year, maybe even being that in the hunt team that's in eighth place going into the final week or something like that. Um, and I think it is notable that in the second half of the season, they started to take those steps forward. And like this is they've put on a masterclass how to rebuild, completely rebuild an NFL roster, trade away your valuable pieces, make a bunch of high draft picks. When you see a potential elite player, take a swing for him as they did here with Jamison Williams and have a coach that gets everybody to play, you know, kind of behind him as Dan Campbell yeah. has. Everyone laughed at him at the beginning, but uh, he got his guys kind of on board with what he was selling. And so I think that uh, that's a really good pick. I would put Detroit very high that even though they didn't put themselves in position for a Super Bowl, that would have been impossible. They are a team to watch for the future as the the Packers eventually fade Detroit is the team that you would pick right now to be there to kind of pick up that slack in the NFC North. Yeah. I mean, I, I would probably agree with that. And, you know, I was there at the senior bowl, they were coaching there, you know, that team, they just hired a bunch of like former players to be coaches on the roster uh, for the coaching staff. And I just got to be around those guys. I mean, they're so together. It's like, it's like a coaching staff, like a locker room. It, it's, it's kind of impressive. Like Mark Brunel, Dan Campbell, Antoine randall -El, um, their linebackers coach, his name is slipping my mind right now, but he's another one. There are so many guys who are former players and they're basically players as coaches and they're so together and they get all these players to really buy in like the entire senior bowl roster, their roster, they were, it was so electric being around them. It just feels like that's what goes on every single day at practice. This is what goes on once they're on the field. That's why they played so hard last year. And it feels like as they keep on adding more pieces of this roster, they're heading in the right direction, in my opinion. And uh, my next pick will be another team yeah. that is at the bottom and has a chance to go up. I think maybe the biggest improvement in coaching in NFL history, uh, or at least close. May, once upon a time in Vikings history, Bud Grant came back after Les Steckel had been a disaster. So that might be the biggest improvement going from Steckel to Grant. But Doug Peterson following up Urban Meyer alone is a gargantuan <laughs> improvement. And, and here's, here's the thing about the Jaguars offseason, which has been widely criticized by a lot of people. Uh, number one, yes, they overpaid Christian Kirk. But you can overpay people when you have a quarterback on a rookie contract. Not only that, you're Jacksonville. How are you supposed to get anyone to play for you, you if you Thank don't you. overpay yes. them? Yes. Uh, Zay, Zay Jones can play in the NFL. Christian Kirk can help you. Um, you know, there are certainly questionable moves, even down to the draft pick of Trayvon Walker. Taking him over Aiden Hutchinson is a little bit questionable. And right away, he might not be a superstar, and it might take some time to develop. 
but you could see that team based on coaching and the free agent improvements that they made right away. Because I never thought that last year they had like no talent whatsoever. They didn't have enough talent to compete. They had more talent than a one win football team, right? I think that they were better than that. So, um, you know, I, I think that, or did they get two, was it two wins or one? Yeah, they, they won the week 18 game against oh, Indy. So that, that was two. Right. There you go. Okay. Congratulations to them. Uh, so the two, a two win football team, uh, but you know, Doug Peterson alone should take a huge jump forward with them. Uh, Urban Meyer didn't even know the players in the NFL. He was kicking people before games or whatever. I mean, just like total nonsense going on partying in bars and not flying home with his team. Uh, Doug Peterson will not have any professionalism issues. I don't think in Jacksonville and plus we've seen this many times. The, the quarterback who gets drafted high rookie year struggles. They all struggle in their rookie year. And then second season, that's where they take the big jump. We saw that from Joe Burrow. I wouldn't be surprised at all if we see that from Trevor Lawrence. I think that team has a very legitimate chance to compete for that division. Yeah. And first of all, the coaching search with them, I mean, it, it was such a rocky, weird one. I mean, if you guys remember, there was the left witch thing and there was the balky. Should he stay? Should he go? Do people want to work with him? Getting to Peterson, it took a very weird avenue to find its way to him but they got to him i agree with you it's it's a tremendous hire and what you said about free agency yes they overpaid for so many people but you nailed it they have to do that in order to get people to come to jacksonville i mean if you look at right now in cincinnati with the bengals they basically did the same thing in a way a couple off seasons ago where they overpaid a bunch of guys got them in the building and now players will want to play with Joe Burrow. That's what you're hoping ends up happening with Trevor Lawrence. But for now, you're Jacksonville. You're a bad team. You've been bad for so long. Let's get players in the building. We're going to overpay for these guys. Some will work. Some probably won't. But at the end of the day, we have some players on this roster and we're able to at least be in games. Again, there were some stuff that were questionable. The draft was a bit of an interesting one, the way they handle everything. We'll see how it all plays out. But having the players in the building, having the right coaching staff, I think is definitely a step forward for that team. Very curious to see how Trevor Lawrence does here in year two. For my second pick, this will be another, probably another surprising one, but I'm going to go with the Giants. And the, the reason why I go with the Giants, I'm here from New York. I get to see a lot of Giants fans here. It's because they made a bit of a dramatic change where they finally went away from all the family ties with how they run things. I mean, the Giants hiring Joe Shane as a GM, it was the first time they've hired a GM who did not have previous experience with the organization since 1998. It's been a very long time. Like when they hired Dave Gettleman in 2018, that was not even a real search. I mean, that was the guy they wanted. They interviewed like four guys, went back to Gettleman, hired him right away. It was a complete disaster. They finally go outside their building, hired Joe Shane, and he brings in Brian Dable, and then he hires guys onto his staff who he kind of doesn't have familiarity with either, but it's like, let's get the best people in the building. It's like a Matt Kafka at OC, Wink Martindale at DC. And what I loved about that, again, is the fact that it's not I'm getting my buddies to come in. It's the guys who are best fit to join this coaching staff. So that's part of it. And then they kind of walked into a bit of a bad cap situation. The roster has so many overpriced players. But, you know, declined the fifth-year option of Daniel Jones. That's a smart business decision. Drafting Kayvon Thibodeau and Evan Neal, those are two premium positions at high picks who will come in right away and make an impact. It just feels like the Giants took a step forward this offseason for the first time in a very long time, and they have the right people in the building for the first time in a long time. So that's the reason why I have them on this list as well. They didn't make any major free agent signings. They had a good draft, but it's a team that finally there's a bit of a breath of fresh air in New York for the Giants, and it feels pretty good here in New York because of that. Yeah, we don't know if Brian Dable will be a good coach, but it's hard to be as bad of a coach as Joe Judge was. Very similarly, not quite as dramatic as Urban Meyer, but similarly in terms of its badness. Uh, and I think that what we realize is that there are a few coaches who raise the level of their team every single year. Mike Tomlin is one of them. Bill Belichick, they're still the great coaches. And then there's a lot in the middle that it's entirely, if you have a great roster, it's a competent enough coaching staff, they'll make mistakes, they'll make great decisions. But at the bottom, you just can't win with a horrendous coach. It's very, very hard to do. Um, you know, maybe some Packers fans would say Mike McCarthy did a lot of it, but I wouldn't even put him in that category. He's much more in the middle for me. If you're a Joe Judge or Urban Meyer, your team is going absolutely nowhere. So if Brian Dable can take a lot that he learned from Sean McDermott, who to me moved himself up into the elite coach category over the last couple of years, 
uh, then they have a chance to be at least competitive with Daniel Jones and find out whether there's something there with Daniel Jones. If he was just held back, I'm very skeptical about that. I think he's probably just not a good quarterback, but by declining the fifth year option, unlike say what Carolina did with Sam Darnold or even Cleveland with Baker Mayfield, though I would have done the same thing at the time, but by declining that fifth year option, it just gives them all the options in the world that if this doesn't work out with this roster for next year, that they draft high, they can pick their next quarterback. And if they win 13 games and Daniel Jones is magically great, let's say he's the next Tannehill where all of a sudden he finds the right circumstance and plays really well, then they can sign him to an extension and they can go forward. Um, I think more likely than not, we're talking about them getting their cap correct, getting their franchise going in the right direction. And, and that's really the biggest theme of our conversation here is, is that if you, if you kind of look out into the future when you're making these moves, not every team is, has the luxury of doing that. But when you do, at least you give yourself a shot at being good. There's no guarantees, but you give yourself a shot at being really good in the future. Well, definitely remember, they initially did not want to fire Joe Judge. The original plan was to hire a new GM and inherit Joe Judge. But that, those last few weeks were such a disaster. There was the quarterback sneak on a third and whatever it was from their own goal line. It was such a disaster. They were kind of forced into it. And it was the right decision. Now they have just new people in the building running it and just smart people as well. Brandon Bean, what he's done in Buffalo, trying to bring one of his guys over. I don't know if he's going to do the same thing as Brandon Brandon Bean, but I feel like just having some different people and some different perspectives in the front office. He's also just overhauling the entire scouting department, bringing his own people. It just feels like there's a different feeling around the Giants for the first time in a very long time here in New York. And we'll see how it all goes. But so far, it just feels like it's it's just a different feeling around here in New York, 100%. For my next pick, I'm going to go with my Super Bowl pick, which Ooh. is the Los Angeles Chargers. Ah, uh, yes. I think the Los Angeles Chargers did exactly what you need to do with a quarterback on his rookie contract. Justin Herbert played phenomenal football last year, but was let down in a lot of ways. Uh, by sometimes his coach, but a lot of times just the rest of the roster not being ready to win. And even though this is the toughest division in football, I think the Chargers have a really good chance um, to charge to the front of the AFC West. Uh, and, and, you know, like going out and trading for Khalil Mack, it's just a great decision. I mean, the, the team trading Khalil Mack is not in a situation to use him, but you are. And to compete for a Super Bowl, even drafting a guard, a lot of times I would go, mm, is that really the smart thing to do? But in this situation, yes, yes, it is, because protecting Justin Herbert should be a number one at the top of your list, getting in more playmakers, improving that defense to have Brandon Staley be able to use everything to hit the maximum of his powers. Uh, I think that team has taken themselves from just out of the playoffs to a team that uh, I would put, uh, I don't really gamble, but uh, I would put my money down if I did. If I was using your money, I'd put it down on the Los Angeles Chargers. Absolutely. They're another team on my list here. And it was like weird seeing that shipped with them because Tom Telesco comes from the Bill Polian tree where it's more draft, build, develop, and pay your own guys. Kind of shifted away from that this offseason by trading for Khalil Mack, signing JC Jackson, Sebastian Joseph Day. They just added two more guys this past week with Bryce Callahan, Kyle Van Noy. A lot of veterans on this defense. And it feels like there's a lot of Brandon Staley fingertips, um, finger uh, prints on those moves. You know, guys that he had with the Rams kind of bringing that type of an element over to the chargers as well this is a team that i definitely believe will be competing next season again in a very very difficult afc west ready to mention the broncos who are improved this offseason. the chiefs are the chiefs the Chargers made def- uh, big time improvements and we didn't even mention the raiders who of course added Devonte adams chandler jones and a bunch of other big time names for my final one i'm gonna go and i had i had the chiefs or the eagles here i'm gonna go with the eagles and really it's specifically how they've really handled everything since last year's just debacle. It was two years debacle with Doug Peterson, the way it ended, the losing on purpose on Sunday Night Football in Week 17, getting the higher draft pick, trading back, getting a future first-round pick, and looking at how it's all kind of developed, especially the Carson Wentz trade where you get a future first round there by giving him to Indy. Clearly, it didn't work over there. But looking at what they've been able to turn all those picks into, of course, this draft, you get Jordan Davis, you trade for A.J. Brown, and really looking at that contract, it's a pretty – I don't, I, want, I don't want to call it a team-friendly deal, but it's not what it was basically reported. I mean, there are ways of clearly getting out of that contract in case it doesn't go well after two years. But a big body receiver for Jalen Hurts, and really just to trade 
with the Saints, where they're able to push one of those first round picks over the next year and, and as well get a, a future second round pick as well. It just feels like Harry Roseman was in such a mess after what happened with Doug Peterson and the Philly fans who are always very, very loud were calling for his name. The way he's turned it around, hiring Nick Sirianni, having a pretty solid year last year, turning around the winning seven out of their last nine games, and just seeing the way they handled this offseason, adding A.J. Brown, um, adding Hassan Reddick, um, adding Jordan Davis, getting to Kobe Dean in the, second, in the third round, um, getting their future center in the second round as well. It's just incredible to see where they were two years ago to where they are now, and to have Jalen Hurts for one more year, see how he does, and still have two first-round picks in your back pocket for next year just the way he's been able to build that roster and the way he thinks for the future it's been impressive to see considering where they were after the whole Doug Peterson fiasco went down a couple years ago so the Eagles are the third team for me I'm really impressed by the way they've been they've been able to handle everything after where they were a couple years ago yeah I think what you're really looking to do also in the NFL today is that if you're not 100% sold on your quarterback set up your roster so the next quarterback wants to play for you like think about Tampa Bay. I mean, I'm sure the weather played a role for Tom Brady picking Tampa Bay, but what was it more likely that they had Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, and they could add Rob Gronkowski if he went down there. I mean, that's what Philadelphia wants to be for the next disgruntled quarterback. If Jalen hurts, isn't the guy. And even if he is, I mean, you've built up the roster to this point where you can legitimately compete for a super bowl in the NFC. I mean, the roster is strong enough. AJ Brown, you don't have to wait for him to develop. He comes right in, works with Devonte Smith. Their offensive line is already good. Their running game is already good and will be extra explosive with Jalen hurts. It's really about improving their defense, which I think that maybe there were more things that they could do there. Uh, but if you're comparing just even the off seasons for the Philadelphia Eagles to the Dallas Cowboys. And I think that oh, the wow. Eagles gained a lot of ground there. Right. And so you could see them being a team that takes it from, you know, being just on the fringe there to uh, potentially even winning that division. I think that some of last year also was probably a paper tiger to some extent based on their schedule with a lot of those wins, but you're still talking about a team that's going to have a fairly easy schedule with some of the divisions they play. And I mean, they, decided that it wasn't all perfect. And they said, we need to be better than this. We need to trade a first round pick and go out and get somebody like AJ Brown. I mean, I, yeah, I thought it was a phenomenal off season for the Philadelphia Eagles for now and later, because if Hertz is the guy you're, you're golden and you go forward with him. And if he's not the guy, you either draft someone high next year, or you get, uh, it's hard to predict today who the disgruntled quarterback (sighs) is going to be, but Hey, maybe it's Ryan Tannehill. Maybe he's, uh, they'll ask him to, you know, show Malik Willis how to throw an out route or something. And he'll just <laughs> demand a trade. I don't know. Yep. No guaranteed money left on his contract after this year. Definitely um, one of the quarterbacks to keep an eye on next year. You never know where things could end up going. Last year, we kind of knew it was Russell Wilson and Aaron Rodgers. I don't really know where that is right now. But again, Matt Ryan all of a sudden became available. Maybe your guy, Kirk Cousins, could become available. Whoever it is, there will be veteran quarterbacks that become available. And next year's draft class is believed to be a pretty stacked one. All right, Matthew, I really want to thank you for coming for coming on. Always a good time when you're on. Everyone can follow you on Twitter. It is at Matthew Collar. Thank you so much for your time, and we'll definitely do it again soon. Yep, thanks for having me.